Parshas Kedoshim, the Torah commands Kedoshim to you, and you should be sanctified, you shall be holy. And on the one hand, the Torah is concerned with every single detail, trivial, every single act. Everything is determined exactly, quantified. But on the other hand, they're all components of a whole. And each component has to be in conformity with halacha, but the whole has to be perfect. The style of a person's life, the approach of a person's life, the goal in total, the overall purpose. And we have to have something called a, an impression, like the overall purpose of our life. And that's what Kedoshim to you means. So if we take the 613 mitzvot, what we could really do is divide them up into 613 special singular acts. You know, you have tefillin and you have tzitzit and you have, uh, you know, matzah and maror and, uh, and you have Shabbos and so forth. Each one is a separate act. But there's one concept that unifies it all. And if we live a total life of mitzvot, this is a life of kedusha, of sanctity. So when the Torah says kedoshim to you, then what the Torah means is You've that, said that three times, okay? okay. This is okay. This is not a new mitzvah. It's really, it's really um, a general statement that includes all the mitzvahs. In other words, if you want to ask what should I be doing now, then you turn to Tariq mitzvahs. And they'll answer the question, what to do? But if you want to know what your general approach should be, how to do things, how to live a life as a Jew, that's Kedoshim to you. That's the concept of Kedusha. And, you know, many different philosophies have arisen over the course of the history of, human, of the human race in answer to the question, what is the good life? What is the useful life? The purposeful life? And you have answers that, that go from, from one extreme to the other. You know, the intellect, according to the Greeks, and the Stoics spoke about, uh, uh, you know, being in control of the will. And that's, that's the good life. The Epicureans said defeat pain and, you know, emphasize and, and, uh, and expand pleasure. Everybody... And their uncle had their own answers to the question, what is a good life? But in Yadus, the good and purposeful life is a life of Kiddush. Hashem says, Kiddoshim to you, ki kadosh ani, imitate me. God is the personification in an absolute sense of Kiddush, of sanctity. Everything that God does, every expression of his being is Kedusha, sanctity. We have to imitate that. Our whole life should be a life of sanctity. And every aspect of our life, the Torah the details every single dimension, whether it's the workplace, whether it's, you know, out in the fields and you're, and you're doing the effort, whether it's the, the, the days of the calendar year, whether it's Shabbos and Yontif, whether it's how to give money to the poor and how to borrow money and how to repay loans. Every dimension of reality, every area of human behavior is in control of the halacha, and the purpose is to bring us into a life of kedusha, a life of sanctity. The Ramban here, at the beginning of Kedoshim, tells us that in terms of our attitude, we have to avoid an attitude called novel b'shus Torah. A novel b'shus Torah is not someone who violates any of the mitzvahs of the Torah, but nevertheless, he lives a life that's antithetical to Kedusha. It's not sanctifying. It's a gluttonous life. It's a, it's a life of excess. And so when it comes to single acts, we're talking about the specific. We're talking about every second and everything is calculated and weighed. These are the singular acts that make up the tiring mitzvahs. But when you're talking about the whole, when you're talking about the puzzle, the gestalt, the completion, about integrating all these different single units into one whole, then you're talking about Kedoshim to you. 
then you're talking about living a divine-like life and in every dimension of human behavior to try to imitate God, to elevate your, your life and your behavior to a spiritual level, to a, a level of selflessness, of care for the next one, to the level of, of behavior on, the, uh, on a lofty level that could be morally uh, scrutinized and you'll fulfill everything. That means that every dimension of your life and every attitude, the entire how to do it of your life is governed by Kedusha. That's the goal. And that's why Kedoshim to you becomes the center of all the mitzvahs, in a sense, the hub of all the mitzvahs. It reflects on human dignity. And it means not just complying with the law, because that's already fits into the category of the other Tariq mitzvahs, but how to live a life. What's your goal? What's your attitude? Now, what's fascinating is the relationship that the Torah demands towards one's parents. And fascinating is that the Torah always consistently links the relationship to parents with Shabbos, with the observance of the Shabbos. It seems to be very odd. What's the connection? It's not obvious. It's not apparent that there should be a connection between each emo v'oviv tiro, a man shall revere his mother and his father and observe the Shabbos. You know, if we take a look in Perkhof Vav, it says, Shmar es Shabbos and es Mikdash tiro. So now we have a real Chagadi here, a real chain. We start with Ish Imo Vyov Tiro, and then we go ahead with uh, Shabbos, Eshab Sosai Tishmoru, and then from there we go to Es Mikdash Tiro, revere my, my sanctuary. They seem to be discrete mitzvot and dimensions of human observance, and yet they're all connected one to the other. Why? So the Gemara Kedushin, tells us that there are two mitzvahs that we have, two obligations vis-a-vis our parents. One is called kibud, to honor your parents, and the other is called mora, to revere your parents. For example, the mitzvah of kibud, of honoring your parents, says the Gemara Kedushin, is all about servicing your parents. You give your parents food and drink, you take them in and take them out. You help them around. You dress them when they need to be dressed. You cover them with a blanket when they need to be covered. That's kibbut. And that's a classic mitzvah say that obligates one in positive action. But then we have the mitzvah of mora, of reverence. This is an entirely different dimension. This is a lotase. Although, again, it's formulated in the Torah in the language of an essay, but it's really a lotas and lotas said, don't do the following. Don't contradict your parents. Don't question them. Don't sit in the seat that is designated for a father, for a mother. That's reverence. And the truth is, that this characteristic of mora, of reverence, is a bit odd in a sense, because reverence is something that we feel towards the Almighty, not towards another human being. But somehow the Torah believes that you can have mora for a person, or in the case of the Mishkan, the Migdash, for a building, a structure, in the case of Shabbos, for the time period, all that requires mora, reverence. But the truth is, it's not about reverence to a human being or even to a zman or even to a, a Beis Migdash. It's really 
reverence to the Almighty God. We, we don't. We don't have. We don't have reverence for a person. The Gemara in Masechet Yevamos on Davavam and Beis, with regard to the Migdash, says that our Yira is not for the Migdash, but for the Rebbeinu Shalom who commanded us on the Migdash. When you have Yira for a parent, if you take a look in the Gemara and Kedushin. It's tantamount to showing Yira for Hashem. That's why Rav Yosef tells us that when he heard the pitter-patter of his mother, his mother was approaching, he used to rise up and say, I stand in front of the Shkina that's coming. The awe and reverence that you're obligated to show Hashem, that's what the essence of Mora Migdash is and Mora Aviv Imo and Mora Shabbos. I treat the Shabbos with reverence because the Shabbos is an expression, is a manifestation of the divine presence of the Shekhinah. We have three mitzvahs that are now connected. We have Shabbos, Mora Avivi Imo, and Mora Migdus. So They're all three, in a sense, an expression of Yira for the Shekhinah. But I want to point out something about Yira and Mora. You know, there are two words in Lash HaKodesh that are very similar, mora and pachad. Pachad is antithetical to ava. Pachad means you run away from something. It instills fear in you in the sense that you're worried about your own skin, your own safety. That's called pachad. But a person finds himself in an adverse environment, like for example, in a in a wild forest or or a place where there are wild animals, that's pachad. There's no room for ava in a relationship that generates pachad. But the Torah doesn't command command us to lefachad. But rather, mora of the imo. Ish imo vi of tiro. That's yira. That's not pachad. Yira is, is an experience, is an emotion that can be integrated with ava. There's no contradiction between reverence and love. And I'd like to give an example of this. Awe and love do not negate each other. A great personality can bring feelings of love and awe at the same time. A person is drawn to love someone and at the same time to feel a sense of awe for that person. You know, if I love someone and I yearn to be close to that person, very often that love is engendered by a sense of the greatness of the other, the majesty of the other. And once I feel that kind of gravitational pull, of love because of the majesty and the greatness of the other, I immediately retreat to feel awe, to feel mora. So, for example, if I love God, I feel a yearning for God. I want to get close to God. God is my friend. God is my partner in life. 
But at the same time, with that love for God comes a sense of reverence. The more I realize how great God is, his infinite godless, right? the more I feel a sense of awe. On the one hand, I'm drawn towards God with a sense of deep love. But at the, other, at the same time, I realize that what am I? Who am I in the face of the Almighty? I sort of, in a sense, negate my own value. And that's called mora. I stand in awe of the, of the Almighty, of the Rebona Shalom. So we have the mitzvah of kabed esavicha vesimecha. We have the mitzvah of ish imo v'av tiro. And we have two emotions. One is honor towards the parents, and the other is reverence towards the parents. And the two really integrate very well in a very healthy kind of a relationship because the ava towards one's parents will express itself in a gravitational pull towards one's parents, in a kumva se, in an active mitzvah of kibu. I love my parents and therefore I honor them. I service them. I do whatever I can for them to make them feel comfortable. Machnes umotzi, machase umaldish, machil umashki. But at the same time, without any contradictions, I feel reverence to my parents. It's very much an expression of my relationship to the Almighty, that great awe and reverence. I consider my father and my mother to be great people, unique. I look up to them. I revere them. We're not talking about fear. The Torah never says, fear your parents. You know, there may be issues about how parents should discipline children. And there was an old school of thought that the parents should actually physically, if need be, you know, in a situation of disciplining, to even use physical force. That's pachad. That doesn't engender a sense of yira, of mora of reverence or an awe. I'm awe because as I come closer to my parents through the ava mode of, of emotion, I feel the greatness of my parents. The closer I get, the more I realize how special they are. The more I sense gratitude for everything they did for me. I mean, this leads to an awe, to a reverence, to a mora. So what we have is reverence, and love interwoven without any contradictions, and perhaps both reverence and love, in some sense, are rooted in hakaras hatov and gratitude. My, I love my parents because whether I think about this consciously or not, I'm aware in one in one part of my soul that everything that I have, my life itself is. Who's responsible for that if not my parents? So that's a sense of gratitude. And therefore, I pay up that gratitude with honor, with positive acts and service to my parents. But at the same time, gratitude engenders feelings of reverence because the more I understand what God has done for me, the Chaz de Hashem, the more I realize the greatness of God, is then I sense reverence, certain distance. But it's all out of a sense of, of a gratitude, of hakar sato. In the midst of Shabbos, the Torah commands us Eshab Sosai Tishmoru. 
in the plural. And Chazal speak about the time of Mashiach, which will be brought about by the observance of two Chabasos, two consecutive Chabasos on the part of Klal Yisrael. It's absolutely interesting that the Zohar speaks about Shabbos de Ilah, which is a supernal Shabbos, and Shabbos de Tata, the earthly Shabbos. These are the two Shabbososites. So, Adam Arishog sins, he eats from the Eitz Adas, and Akash Baruch Hu gives him a clove. But Hashem also reserves a bracha for him. God blesses the Shabbos. And whatever curse Adam Arishog received was null and void. When he, when he entered into the Shabbos. But Shabbos represents Makar HaBrocha. It is the essence of blessing. When Hashem says, cursing Avram, that Bezeas HaPecha Tocha by the sweat of your brow shall you eat bread, this means hard labor. Man is no longer in Gan Eden where the gluskos, the beautiful breads, are growing on the trees, just grab one. Now, man is called upon to work very hard with a great deal of labor in order to produce bread. Number two, There's something called Amelus. Let me try to explain what the difference between Amelus and Avoda is. Avoda is constructive. It has a purpose. It has a goal. Amelus is, in a sense, continuous toil, but for no purpose whatsoever. Pointless. So when Shlomo Amelich in Kohela speaks about Odomli Amel Yumlad, he's talking about Amelus that doesn't produce anything. It's like back in the day of the Soviets, they used to put people to work. And this was also true during the Holocaust. And, and there, was no, there was nothing that they were working for. That's why Shlomo Melch in Kohelis constantly repeats the same thing. I look at the product of my deeds, of my hands. It's toil, it's omel, and behold, hakol, hevel, havolim. Everything is vanity, frustration. Ein chadash tachs Hashem, no prophet under the sun. But then Hashem adds another element into the equation. That's the itzavon tochal lechem. Itzavon is, in a sense, suffering, fear. Man, in eking out a living, has to face very stiff competition. So man is cursed to enter into a society in which in order to produce a livelihood, man is fraught with fears. Maybe someone will outdo him, someone might steal his possessions. We're overridden by fear. I mean, that's what Marx, Karl Marx with his socialism tried to counter this fear, this curse of the anxiety of having to make a living. But then we get to the fourth curse. May offer, may uli offer tasha. You were taken from the offer, from the dust of the earth, and you will return to the offer.
So we can summarize the curse that Adam Arishan was given as continuous suffering, exhausting, pointless labor, unproductive, that will result in conflict and ultimately in death. But then Hashem gives Shabbos as a blessing to man. All that work of the six days of the week, which causes man such anxiety, a sense of competition, of fear that others will defeat him and take away his possessions, All that is gone on Shabbos. Shabbos is the day of Menucha. Shabbos is the day in which everything comes to a stop. There's no work. There's no competition. There's no agony of Zeas Apecha. No anxiety. In that sense, we imitate Hashem. Hashem, Vayonach B'Yom Ashvi, He rests on the seventh day. And we too rest, and that rest means we're released from the endless monotony and, and, and the jealousy and all that's involved in eking out a living in mundane, in the mundane pursuit of a livelihood. And that's why when we think about endless work as the curse of other Marishon, in that sense, man has no time for family. He's just totally dedicated to his work. But on Shabbos, is a time for family. The Torah emphasizes that the family rests as a unit. Ata, ubincha, ubitecha, etc. So in a sense, as the members of the family are released from those curses of alienation from neighbors and stiff competition, now new family ties or even old family ties are renewed. Parents and children, siblings. The Gemara tells us in the Sechta Sanhedrin that there was a river called Sambation. It was very tumultuous, very turbulent, very dangerous. But that was only during the week. No one could cross it during the week. But when it came Shabbos, the calm of Shabbos calmed down the river. So Shabbos, down here on earth, represents, as we said, Menucha. But even the curse of death that was heaped upon Adam Arishon is addressed on Shabbos. David HaMelech speaks about the sheer of Shabbos, the song of Shabbos, sing the song of Shabbos. What does that mean? This is the shira of Shabbos Liyasid Lavo. This is the song of the ultimate Shabbos. Shabbos says, Chaye Olam. And Shabbos, of course, the Neshama Yisera connects us to Olam Haba. Vayaral Akim is Kol Asher Asav Hine Tov Ma'od. This was on day six of creation. And what is Tov Ma'od? And Chazal say that Tov Ma'od means total shlema, it's total unity, kol, wholeness, perfection. In the, in the aftermath of the Chetra Egel, man was divided, separate entities. There was good, there was evil, there was darkness, there was light, there was me and you, competition. And this is part of the curse of the Chetra of Adam Arisha. But all this was on the weekdays, not on Chaps. On Shabbos, we have a little bit of what the original creation was all about, because Shabbos was not impacted by the curses that were heaped upon the six days of the week. So on Shabbos, the world 
unifies with the creator, with Hashem, which creates a certain shlemus, a certain Shabbat shalom, as we say, a wholeness of creation. And that wholeness of creation, although now it's just one day a week on Shabbos, will be revealed li osid lovam in olam haba. We speak on Shabbos about sukkah shalom. We speak about ner shel Shabbos, which is a ner of shalom bayis, of peace. In a certain sense, Shabbos protects us with a shelter of peace. Evil departs, competition is gone. Man feels like he's protected by a shelter of rest, of menucha. Peace descends from the heavens onto earth. Shalom Aleichem Alachi Asharis. And this is a taste of Yom Shekulo Shabbos, the Osid Lovo, the future, the great Shabbos. This is the shelter of peace and rest that descends from above onto earth. In a sense, it means a vision of a world free of suffering a world of longing for our Father. And ultimately, the Shabbos liyosid lovo yom chikul Shabbos l'chai olam abba will defeat death. And therefore Shabbos is really, in all its components, the exact opposite of the clothes that we that were rain down on Odom Arishon after the Chet and would dominate his life for six out of seven days. The Torah has a lot to say about the cycle of years in terms of what we call Zroin, the produce of the earth, its bounty. And for example, we have three years of Orla, we have a fourth year of Ravai, and then we go on to Shemitah and Yovel. The Torah speaks about the fourth year in which the fruit is Kodesh, is holy. He lulim Lashem, praises to the Almighty. And it's fascinating that the Gemara in Bracha Oslamet Hay quotes the sheet of Rabbi Akiva from this posse, Kodesh Ilulim Lashem, Rabbi Akiva derives that one must pray, praise the Almighty before he eats and once again after he eats. So once we're about to eat, we make a bracha, we have to praise Hashem for the blessings, for the food that he bestowed upon us. The Gemara tells us that also we're not allowed to derive pleasure from this world without first reciting a bracha. If he derives pleasure from this world without reciting a bracha, he is in Guilty of the violation of me'ila, which means embellishing, it, it, it means embezzling hegdish. But 
The Gemara quotes Rabbi Levi. Kra, the Pasuk, one Pasuk says, La Shem Ha everything belongs to God. And yet in another Pasuk, these are all Pasukim in, in Tehillim, La ha, he gave the earth to the children of men. So who owns the earth? Is it that everything belongs to God? Or that Haaretz Nasan live Adam? So the Gemara says, "Can kodem bracha v'kan liachem bracha." Before the bracha, the pasuk tells us that kol anenem in olam hazeb lo bracha ki umah. But after we recite the bracha, haaretz nasan livnei adam, we acquire ownership over the world. So yes, Ha'aretumaloa Lashem is is his because we didn't make a brach. But once we make the bracha, then it becomes Ha'aretz Nasan Livne Adam. It's yours. You acquire ownership. And if you benefit from the world without a bracha, it's mal because the entire world is considered hegdish. It is consecrated to the Almighty. And if you're deriving pleasure without a bracha, then you're violating the prohibition of Hegdesh, of Me'ilah. Now, we have two derivations. We had Rabbi Yekiva who derived the mitzvah of bracha from Kodesh Hilulim Lashem. On the other hand, we have the Gemara that states in the name of Rabbi Levi that the world is God's. Lashem Aretzumaloa. But by reciting the bracha, it becomes a Aretz Nasan Livnei Adam. I would like to suggest a chidush here based on Rabbi Akiva. If we only had the opinion that kan kodem bracha, kan li acher bracha, and the purpose of the bracha is to remove the iser me'ila, because kol anenem no zeblo bracha kilumal, then I have the following question. Gemara says that if a person ate a meal and then he reminds himself that he did not make the bracha before he ate. The Gemara says that he's not allowed to eat now that he knows he didn't make a bracha. He would be violating me'ila. But on the other hand, if he wants to eat, he should make a bracha. But not only that, the Gemara says that according to one opinion, even if he already ate, he ate without a bracha, then he makes a bracha. Even if he's not going to eat anymore. And the question is obvious. The Gemara says, kan kodem bracha, kan liachar bracha. That we need the bracha to remove the isa me'ila. This man has already eaten. Shall we say he's satiated? And he bangs himself on the head and says, I remember now that I didn't make a bracha. So what good is that? You violated an Easter me'ila by benefiting from this world without a bracha. What sense does it make to obligate him in a bracha after he's already eaten? I thought that maybe the answer is Rabbi Akiva. Kodesh Hilulim Lashem. From which Pasuk? 
Rabbi Akiva der- derives the conclusion that we praise Hashem before we eat and after we eat. If the purpose of the bracha is just to remove the Iser Me'ila, then if he's already eaten, and now he reminds himself he didn't recite a bracha, there's no point to that bracha. The bracha is not going to remove the Iser Me'ila that he's already violated when he consumed the food. But if we introduce Rabbi Akiva's understanding into the equation, that the bracha is generated by Kodesh Ilulim Lashem, then it's a totally different type of brach. It's not a brach to be matu the iser me'ila, but rather it's a kiyum mitzvah. It's a positive mitzvah to thank Hashem, to express gratitude to Hashem. You should have done it before you ate, but now you already, you've already eaten. Make the bracha now. Because the purpose of the bracha is not to be matir me'ila and take and benefit from hegdish. The purpose of the bracha is kodesh ilulim. Ilulim means to be mahalel Hashem, to express gratitude to Hashem. And within a reasonable amount of time after he finishes the meal, any sort of expression of gratitude is connected to the meal that he ate, albeit not before the meal, but after the meal. Because he has not fulfilled his obligation and achieved his kiyum of praising Hashem, and then we could say as long as there's some relationship between his bracha and the food that he ate, then in a chinami we can consider it as if he was mekayim, that mitzvah of praising Hashem. The Torah repeats itself over and over again about remembering Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim. The Ahavta Loka Mocha Ki Gerim Hayisen the Eretz Mitzrayim. You shall love him as you love yourself, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. In the parish of Inui Ger or Almona, the Torah says, you shall not mistreat a stranger nor oppress him, for you are strangers in the land of Mitzrayim. So we're called upon to help and love a stranger in the land. That's an enormous burden, an ethical burden to help another Jew. And the Torah says, remember how you felt when you were in distress. You were an Eved. In Eretz Mitzrayim. So when you ask the question, why does Mitzrayim play such a major role? That the hub it's, rep- it's repeated millions of times with regard to many different mitzvahs. But the answer is because what is the birth of our nation? We were born in the Kura Barzel. This is the crucible. This is the suffering, the bondage, the humiliation, the pain. And we emerge in the Midbar and the sand dunes of the Sinai, and we are a wandering nation. 40 years we wandered through the desert. We are not a people in our own land. Why? Why all this? But the answer is to make us into a moral nation, a nation of kindness, a nation of chesed, of sensitivity towards the needs of someone else. Only we who suffered so much can feel that pain, can identify with the suffering of another Jew. People who went into Golos could understand what it means to be kind.
Mitzrayim is the experience that appears over and over again throughout the entire Torah because it sheds a light on the ethical or morality of every single Jew. Our sense of morality is rooted in our history. Our human dignity, our covet of risk was robbed away in Mitzrayim, was taken away. And the Torah wants to guarantee that we will respect human dignity. We will never abuse another person. We will never abuse a weak person, a helpless person. It's all about Rahmanus, about compassion, about sensitivity. And we derive this ethics from our experience as a defenseless nation uprooted in exile, in Mitzrayim. That is the burden of our ethical norm. But I want to talk to you about two words that describe kindness and compassion. There's rachamim and there's rachmanus. What's the difference between rachamim, which comes from the verb rachem, and merachem? Rachmanus is, in a sense, a derivation from Rachamon. The Rachamon describes a person as a compassionate individual. And let me embellish this a little bit further. When you say Merachim, you're describing his action. He acts in a sense who engages in a, an act of loving kindness. That's a marachim. And marachim is different than a Rachamon. How so? Whereas Merachim is a description of the acts of kindness, it says nothing about the essence of the person, but rather their it reflects on his actions. That's a marache. But a rachamon describes the person himself in his essence, not his actions. He's not a marache on various occasions, right? A marache here, a marache there. He's a rachman. His personality is identified with love and compassion for others. He knows nothing other than Rachmanus because he is a Merachim. He's a Merachim by his very nature, by his very disposition, by the very essence of his personality. He overflows with love. You would not describe the Chafetz Chaim as a Merachim, although for sure he was. But he's a Rachman. That is his very personality trait, overflowing with love. And the experience of Mitzrayim was such that we were treated not like people, but rather like objects. And this is going to be the experience of the Jew throughout 
the bitter history of Golos. We're going to be exposed to all sorts of chicanery, all sorts of being treated as objects, not as people in Persia, will be sold by the Melech to the Prime Minister to Haman for slaughter and annihilation. And all these experiences are meant to engender within us a certain sensitivity, an emotional tenderness, to feel for the plight of others. A Jew is saturated in his very personality with compassion and mercy. He's not just a marachim, he's a rachamon, describing his very essence. So the experiences of Golos in Mitzrayim, in Paras, made an indelible impression on our very personalities. And without these experiences, we would have been callous and coarse and tough, unemotional, not feeling for the plight of others. So the Torah will go over time after time especially in Sefer Shmos, whenever it speaks about our duty towards others, the feelings of others, especially towards the feelings of those who are helpless, lonely, defenseless. And the Torah will always remind us that we were aliens in Mitzrayim. Don't forget what you experienced. The gufcha. And the Torah says that there are chukim and mishpatim. Ushmartem is called chukosai, is called mishpatai, vasisem osam. And then the Torah goes ahead and gives us a long list of mitzvos. Mitzvos asem, mitzvos los asem. And concludes with this verse, ushmartem is called chukosai, is called mishpatai. We have reverence for parents, as we said before. We have the mitzvah peah to leave over the corners of the field for the poor, leket, the gleanings of the sheaves, shichacha, that which fell. We have laws against gneva, not stealing, and gzela, not embezzling, schar socher, not to oppress a worker, but rather pay his wages on time. We're enjoined from placing a stumbling block before the blind. Do not hate your brother in your heart. Love your fellow human being as you would love yourself. So why does the Torah summarize this by by formulating Uchmatim, it's called Chukosai. That's called Mishpatai. I understand Mishpatai. But why integrate Chok and Mishpat? Where's Chok over here? Chukim appear to us as unreasonable, illogical, enigmatic, a meaning that's beyond our grasp. Chukim represent ultimate faith and trust in the Almighty. We don't understand the reason for the Chukim, but our amuna, our trust, our faith in God tells us that the chukim are reasonable, just as much as the mishpatim. Hashem gave the, the Zion mitzvahs b'nei noach for the b'nei noach, they're all mishpatim. But only in our case of the Jewish nation, we are given not only mishpatim, but also chukim. Chukim that are not readily understood. And this concept of chukim really touches on the very 
essence of our relationship to the Almighty, which obligates us to go beyond logic, to trust in Hashem totally. Will we understand? No. But at the end of days, retroactively, in retrospect, everything will be understandable. The relationship to the state of Israel is chok. We cannot understand why the enlightened nations of the world hate the state of Israel, try to do everything they can to undermine it. And this is spreading like wildfire throughout the youth. It's a chok. Can we understand it? Perhaps in retrospect, at the end of time, we'll understand all the suffering that we went through in the establishment of the state of Israel. I know we're running out of time, but I would like to spend just five minutes, perhaps, on the mitzvah of Shemitah at the beginning of Parshas Bahar. And the Torah opens up with Har Sinai. In Achrimos, the Torah describes Eretz Yisrael as a land that is filled with kedusha, with sanctity, and cannot tolerate contamination and transgression. And Parshas Bahar takes this theme, this Yisod, one step further in Shemitah and Yovel. Eretz Yisrael is governed by direct Hashkocha Pratis, divine providence. Eretz Asher, Ene Asher Melukecha Ba, Merechis Hashanah, Yad Sof Hashanah. If the Jewish people are concerned about Shemitah and how to observe the Shemitah, do they have the ability to serve and observe the Shemitah? The Torah tells us that Eretz Yisrael is not a land like any other land. Eretz Yisrael is attuned to the needs of the Jewish people. And the mushal is, if you care for another person, then you respond to the needs of that beloved person. And Eretz Yisrael will respond to the needs of the Jewish people. It's like a living personality. And it's different than any other land. And the Torah tells us, we enter into the land, the land shall rest, a Shabbos Lashem. And once again, the land will rest. The land possesses a personality, a distinct personality. It can be defiled, as we saw in Pashas Achrimos. It could be a land of Vishavsa, of resting, of observing the sabbatical years just like a human being could be defiled or he could be sanctified, he could rest. A Jew observes the Shemitah and a Jew treats the land as if it possessed a personality. And the Jew is called upon to sanctify the land. just as we are commanded in Kedoshim to you to sanctify ourselves.
we spoke about Vishov Saha Oritz. The land will rest. It possesses, as we said before, a distinct personality like a human being who can rest the earth. The land can rest. The Jew observes the Shabbos once a week. The land of Israel observes its own Shabbos once every seven years. Sheishanim tizra sadecha. You may sow your field for six years. The Torah grants man the privilege of creating plants, destroying it, if necessary, for his own sustenance. But all man has is really tenants' rights. Everything belongs to God. Shabbos Shabbos on Yeh, Shabbos Lashem. On Shemitah, God cancels man's rights, his ownership. He for forbids man to exploit the land, to reap its growth. Hashem's rights are rehabilitated, so to speak, reactivated every seven years. And the land shall have a complete rest at, Sha at Shabbos Lashem. So Shemitah and Yovel is the idea that man does not truly own anything. It all belongs to God. We're only tenants. And when we use the term Shabbos for both the seventh day of the week and the seventh year, what that means is that Shabbos is Edus, is witness that God created the world. And man has faith that God created and that faith is halachically required. A Shabbos violator is considered a mumar lechol kula, as if he had violated the entire Torah. He denies the authority of God over creation. And so too in Shemitah, when we restore the authority of Hashem over the land, we proclaim God as the creator and the maker of all of the land. And now the Torah enjoins us for any of the 39 categories of work on Shabbos that would involve a violation of the Shabbos. And these malachas are called malachas machsheves, an intentional action that results in constructive work. Mekalkel, which is destructive, that's mutter on a derisive book. Shemitah is also called Shabbos, because like Shabbos, it's a day of surrender. The surrender of our authority, of our ownership to the true authority, the true owner, with a capital O. And the Torah goes out of its way to emphasize, V'ahoyu l'cha yimei sheva shabsos ha'shonim teisha v'yarboim shonah. We've already indicated in the Torah that we count seven sets of seven years. So obviously, you know, we get to the 49th year at the end of this counting. What is the Torah teaching us? And perhaps the answer is the Torah is teaching that the 49 years are not merely a part of progression, each of which loses significance as soon as the next year arrives, but rather each year has its own independent significance. The 49 years are cumulative. And for Hayulicha. Okay, then. Hi, Rabbi Zon.